Moving on, changing the field and changing the technology. We put together, Victoria put together a very, very nice panel discussion working with IT, data science and supercomputers. Now it gets uh, heavily hardware um, at uh, Helmholtz. <clears throat> so um, we um, uh, welcome uh, to the stage uh, Dr. Charlotte Debus. Um, she is a junior research group leader at the Steinbuch Center for Computing at the Karlsruhe Institute of uh, Technology. Great to have you with us, Charlotte. Uh, we also welcome to the panel Dr. Robert Speck from the Research Center in Jülich. He is the head of the Department for Mathematics and Education. Great to have you, uh, Robert. And from the more user side of the large systems, uh, we have with us Wolfgang Zuckerstell. Um, he is the head of the Department for Geoinformation and CIO of the Helmholtz Center um, in uh, Potsdam for Geosciences. Wolfgang, great to have you with us again. Okay, Hi. so um, first of all, let me thank you for taking um, the time to talk to uh, this very international crowd. Uh, Victoria, Anne and Sandra collected over 1,200 registrations for this virtual career day. And I think we have a good 300 people online. So you're speaking to a big, big auditorium at the moment without even uh, noticing. Um, so uh, we agreed upon a very short round of introduction. What do you do in 100 seconds? Charlotte, you want to take us up? Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as said, I'm with the Steinbuch Center for Computing at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, um, where I since very recently lead the junior research group Robust and Efficient AI. Um, I'm originally a physicist, um, but I've worked in the field of data science since my PhD. And uh, since then, I've moved more and more into the domain of computer science. Now, I've been with Helmholtz for almost all of my academic career. Um, so I did my PhD at the German Cancer Research Center on the topic of machine learning based image analysis for brain tumors. Um, and I then spent one and a half years as a postdoc at the German Aerospace Center in Cologne working on high performance data analytics of rocket fuel combustion experiments uh, before in 2020 I came to KIT. And KIT as the research university in the Hamels Association has a very strong focus on the field of energy. Uh, and so for the past two years, I've been de developing AI approaches for energy research as part of the Hamels AI consulting team before I started my own group uh, in September. And SCC is KIT's computing center. And besides all the IT related things like web and email services and IT infrastructure, SCC also runs the tier two uh, supercomputer Horeca, which is also part of the Hamels AI compute resources high core. Um, and this actually fits very well with my own research interests um, and that of my group, which focuses specifically on scalable AI. So how can we run modern machine learning models on large supercomputers? Fantastic. So from image analysis to rocket fuel to energy system, all tied together by large computer based questions and AI. Thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. Uh, Robert, your field of research, your duties in 100 seconds. Me, I'm here. So I'm Robert Speck from the Jülich Supercomputing Center at Research Center Jülich. I'm the head of the department, uh, math and education, as just said. And I'm also leading a research group on some obscure numerical topic, if you want to say it like that. I'm very much interested in uh, everything that does not scale on supercomputers, because that's uh, those are the most important and most uh, interesting problems. But more recently, uh, I got involved in the research software engineering and community building in that field. So the research center at Jülich, or as some people may say, strange men in the woods, has about 7,000 employees and covers a multitude of different topics. So a very large center with very different uh, ideas, topics, and researchers. Um, so started as a nuclear research facility. That's why we are in the woods. Um, and but we now do research on energy, bioeconomy, uh, climate, and inform information. Supercomputing is part of information here. And on campus, you can see fully automated greenhouses, an atmospheric chamber, very large magnets for medical imaging, and one of the fastest supercomputers in Europe. So across all these fields, we have uh, around 850 PhD students working with us. We have around six, 300 postdocs 
and offer nearly 100 apprenticeship places. And there are guest student programs and summer schools and internship offered by all the different institutes, but also within the supporting administration at laboratories. Uh, at the supercomputing center, we focus on cutting edge or, well, bleeding edge sometimes, uh, supercomputing architectures, methods, tools, and simulations. This also includes big data analytics, machine learning, of course, and uh, more recently, quantum computing and neuromorphic computing. We're very much interested in all things related to modern and upcoming computing technologies. And of course, we're, as everyone, always looking for people sharing this passion with us. All right. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, and he is right. Jülich is quite far off in the countryside, but guys, you have to check it out. It's an amazing research facility. I was here last week and I'm always blown away by all the cool stuff they're doing there. And the third one in the round uh, is Wolfgang Castell, um, uh, Potsdam Geoforschungszentrum. Wolfgang, what do you do in your daily research work? 100 seconds. Hi and welcome everybody. It's, it's great to be here and clearly Potsdam is not that much of a village, but there's a uh, um, high expertise on uh, geosciences. So I'm, my background is mathematics and I studied mathematics in um, Erlangen and Franconia and then somehow ended up in Munich actually at the Institute where Julia Schnabel is and learned there how to use mathematical methods. But you soon learn that math is much more and but you have to find ways basically to talk this interdisciplinary language. And that's what brought me into data science and machine learning. Now, from the very, very small in Munich, I went to the very, very large in Potsdam. So now we are studying in Potsdam system Earth as a whole. And it's quite interesting and fascinating um, how much data there is around and it's global data and it's worldwide data. So we can use all this data and use uh, modern machine learning type approaches um, basically to estimate risks, to estimate natural hazards like tsunamis or, or earthquakes. We can explore towards understanding how we can use the earth as resources. So for geoenergy or geothermal energy and things like this. And for all of that, we need to bring together a lot of data and we need to understand it and um, try to make sense out of that. And the other part of my job is then basically running the computer center and the data management at Potsdam. That's uh, what the CAO role is and something which also brought me together. So we do need to bridge to supercomputing because this is the only way we can understand the really large systems. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. So um, as you heard, we have uh, quite a diverse crowd here, but um, we have the feeling there's one question that ties everything here together. And um, that is, what role does supercomputing, high performance computing systems play in today's research? I mean, if I go to university, you have a more classical uh, education in, let's say, biology or geology or physics even. Um, I don't necessarily touch a supercomputing system, but I have the feeling that a lot of things are going on there. So um, let me pitch you this question. What do you think? What kind of role um, do high performance computing systems play in today's uh, research? Wolfgang, you want to start us out? Yes, for sure. I mean, we want to clearly understand how the Earth works, but we only have this one Earth. So we can't do very many experiments with this one Earth. But what we can do is we can clearly try to model it, the Earth in what we call a digital twin. So we really try to build up um, Earth into the computer. Now you can imagine Earth is complicated, Earth is large, and similarly it is with the computing we need. So there are many, many processes. There is the atmosphere, there's the ocean, there is the solid Earth. And to bring all of this together, we really need to have a chance um, to compute this in very much great detail and with high independence. And this can't be done on small systems under our table. So we really need the supercomputers um, to run the Earth and to run experiments there and to get a better understanding. All right. What, what are your thoughts, uh, Robert? What kind of impact do high-performance computing systems have on today's domain research? Uh, well, a crucial one, I would hope, working at a supercomputing center. But uh, the key here is that, I mean, simulation science has like considered to be, to be the uh, third pillar uh, of science whatsoever, right? Besides theory and experiment. And as Wolfgang just said, there are things you just cannot uh, do experiments on, right? If you want to understand how, you, how the galaxy formed, what else can you do? Well, you can write down uh, formulas, that's, that's for sure. And uh, very clever people did this. But if you actually want to see what that means, you need to have supercomputers. But on the other hand, I mean, we're talking about digital twins, correct? And, and uh, astrophysics, 
But I don't know if you were interested in weather, and most people are uh, when they leave the house, uh, then most of the uh, weather services use and have to use supercomputers. So most of us actually get in touch with supercomputers every day without even realizing it. And that's not the only part. So uh, it, it has a big impact on science, We're talking about uh, machine learning, big data analytics whatsoever. That can't be without supercomputing. Uh, and also on uh, uh, on society. So I believe that's that's uh, there's this we can't go back. Let's put it that way, and we don't want to, and we better should not. Okay, um, Charlotte, um, during your introduction, you mentioned you're trying to scale AI. So Wolfgang explained to us that simulating or modeling a large system is quite uh, data and compute intensive. I can completely understand that. But why does AI need so much computing power and supercomputing? Oh more than ever. I mean, these, these simulation things are the traditional way of uh, domains of HPC, but the trends we've been seeing in AI, especially deep learning research in the past five years, go towards bigger data, bigger models, larger runtimes, and there is no way you can do these things without large-scale supercomputer or hardware infrastructures. I mean, look at Open uh, at GPT-3, which has 175 million trainable parameters. Unbelievable. AlphaFold needed 128 uh, TPUs. That's not something that you have in your backyard. So I think for, for the future of AI, we have bigger problems. We have bigger data sets. Now we have bigger models, so we need bigger computers. However, I would also say that HPC is not only about supercomputers, it's just about performance. So you could consider a single GPU to be a high performance computing system as well. And I think everyone will agree without GPUs, AI wouldn't be where it is today. Great, great um, uh, insight there. Um, Victoria reminds me that everybody should utilize the Q&A button in the chat if you have questions later on to the crowd. Okay, sorry about the, uh, the interruption. So. Um, let, let me try to um, uh, bring this uh, to, to a student's uh, perspective. I mean, we have a lot of uh, young people, master students, uh, PhDs uh, on their early stages here. So um, what, what is the difference between um, uh, the, the skills that I need to actually code down a program or code a supercomputing system ready? Charlie, could you, could you expand a little bit on that? Oh, definitely, because before I came to DLR, I had never even like worked on a supercomputer, so I had to dive into this. Um, I think the main the main situation is that you have you have no interface, so everything's shell based um, from a like very uh, workable point of view. Um, and I think you have to also rethink your algorithms because you do not have joint memory anymore. You have uh, larger storages, but also everything needs a bit more time because not everything is fused into one computer on your desk. Um, you have communication between different um, hardware nodes um, and that changes the way common algorithms work. Um, and this is actually where a lot of research also is happening on how can we distribute these, how can we use our common algorithms in distributed settings. Um, and that is sort of a paradigm shift in your mind. And that's something that you have to learn. The programming language, I mean, like all programming, you do this on the side, I guess. Well, but this sounds a little, um, uh, let's say, hard to do, right? So uh, if I listen to you, I have to take a whole new uh, couple of semesters in studying large-scale computer architectures and software. Um, uh, Robert, you talked to you about uh, research software engineering. Can you maybe uh, dim down the uh, um, level of uh, fright now that uh, I have to uh, study something completely new to utilize the system a little bit? <laughs> well, you don't have to. People do, but you don't have to, right? I mean, that's one of the great advantages of, of working in this field is that this is very interdisciplinary, right? People are coming from physics, coming from extremely different backgrounds with math, in uh, computer science, engineering, and even completely unrelated fields. And people still manage uh, to work with supercomputers. The thing is, um, it's, it's easy to get started, I think, because there are quite a few uh, programming paradigms and programming languages which help you to get first things going, right? To code a GPU, you don't have to necessarily learn shader technology anymore, thankfully. Uh, but when you're actually talking about supercomputing and extreme scales, then 
you better learn more on that. But you don't have to. So it, it, it's basically learning as you go, right? You don't have to do everything from the very beginning. It's basically start small, get larger, and then get help. That's the other thing. Without a community, uh, and that's especially true for research software engineering, you need the community for you just to help because you don't have to reinvent the wheel over over again, right? Everything, most things already have been done in that the questions you may have have been answered maybe you can look at google that's easy but you can just ask a dear colleague that's i think crucial because you you don't have to be on your own and that's that's key for for, for this field and there's another great thing about the large Helmholtz programs because you will have a lot of uh, people all around you who can uh, help you with uh, scaling up your uh, problem um, Wolfgang, uh, I would love to come back to the Earth. As you mentioned before, it's very big. So I assume that if I want to go into climate and Earth system modeling, I'm also talking like very big data, right? And not also uh, very big compute, but also big data. Could you um, maybe introduce us a little bit into the challenges and the excitement about working with these enormous data sets that you guys are using in the climate and Earth system technologies? Yeah, sure, I can. And this is good to, to that you're mentioning the data because this is the other challenge we have with the supercomputing. The data very often is not lying there where the computer is. So you have to think about what is the best way. And then sometimes it might even be better to bring the code to the data rather than the data to the code because it might be so large. So if you think about satellites um, flying around the Earth, observing the Earth in, uh, in a hyperspectral range, so various images on the same time, so to say, this is a huge amount of data. And the challenge there basically, again, is similar to what um, Steve just described with supercomputing. It's nothing you just download quickly onto your machine and play a little around with. So you really have to use these pipelines being there. Um, but this is also the great chance. Yeah, suddenly you see, see um, possibilities um, using stuff which you may know just from the experimental side outside there and on a very, very small scale. And suddenly you can do it on a global scale. I think this is also the, the nice thing here. And let me just add to the HPC because I think this also fits um, to the data. You never do this alone. We have these groups, we have groups building on community code, we have libraries. So we have these experts and normally you're working within one of those groups. And I think this is the great chance we have. You can deal with this stuff, you can deal with this happy and, and, and or great technology and this heavy stuff, yeah, but at the same time, you never need to do it alone. So you're brought into a team and, and learn it step by step. And this is similarly true for um, the huge data sets we have. Thanks. Uh, thank you for, for pointing that out again. So guys, if you would join Wolfgang and his team, you would immediately be part of a global community because climate research obviously is a global uh, endeavor. Um, um, Robert, coming, coming back to you, um, you uh, briefly mentioned the new system. You, I think you talked about neuromorphic or quantum. Do you um, uh, care to, to share a little bit of uh, your future perspectives on computing for the next decade to come? What will change? What will happen? New paradigms on the horizon? I, I, I guess I can earn a ton of money if I, if I <laughs> only knew. Um, the thing is, uh, I, I think that's one of the most exciting questions, right, is the emergence of quantum computing and the interplay with classical HPC. So I guess by now many people are, are okay with classical HPC and now comes along quantum computing and now everyone's like, oh my God, so that's, that's just new. So yes. This is a this is a shift in uh, in perspective again. Uh, so sometimes it's called um, uh, post von Neumann architecture. So this is not the classical computing as we know it. But one of the uh, one of the goals we have here at Jülich is that uh, we actually would like to join both worlds. So within a computer, not necessarily one system, but actually one big uh, modular supercomputer where you can actually decide where you want to run stuff, where you want to, where part of your code can run. Maybe uh, some part is uh, data heavy and it should run on something which has just fast uh, access to data. The other one is uh, uh, can, can work very well on uh, GPUs. So you better use a GPU cluster, which is very large. And then maybe you have an optimization problem, which happened to fit very well on a quantum computer. I don't want to code this, that's for sure. <laughs> but the thing is, you can. And given time, people will be able to do this. And our uh, our task here is to first enable people to do this, or first enable the machines to actually allow this, and then enable people to do this. But I guess this hybrid computing, supercomputing and quantum computing, that's like 
that's like a very challenging and interesting uh, uh, item for the future. A lot of great things coming up. And I hear that the first exascale system will actually come to the first system unit. Is that true? I, I've heard so too, yes. <laughs> so we uh, by uh, June 15th, uh, Euro HPC, the EU Commission decided that the first uh, European exascale system will uh, go to uh, to Jülich, uh, or the Gauss Center for Supercomputing with uh, the hosting site in Jülich. And uh, 2023, we'll, we'll start uh, buying, building, and uh, crying, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but when the crowd here is done with their master's degree, they can directly go to Ulic and help put together these amazing machines. Yeah. All right, um, Charlotte. Um, uh, I want to come back uh, to you and uh, the question: What what's uh, the difference between model based and data based approaches? I mean, uh, as I understand it, AI opens the door for basically a paradigm shift in in the way that uh, we conduct science, right? I mean, uh, if I look at a system with so many parameter sets that I'm not even able to uh, formulate very neat uh, data independent formulas, but I have to rely on, uh, on AI. What are your thoughts? Um, what will happen to this analytical model based sciences in the future? Will they continue to exist or will we rely heavily on, on AI um, based um, analysis in the future? <laughs> oh, this is a tricky question. I couldn't make a lot of enemies now. Uh, no, actually, person, right? <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, actually coming from physics, um, I'm a firm believer that these um, model based approaches from fundamental principles, you will not make them go away just because you throw a bunch of parameters at a problem. Um, so these approaches are valid and they can solve a lot of problems that we have by now. I think the um, the prospect or the promise of AI is that some of these we can maybe solve faster or more energy efficient, uh, which is a huge deal these days, uh, computing costs electricity. Uh, and that's giving a lot of data centers a lot of headache. But also you can now go towards um, problems or, or situations where we don't know what is happening below. This is why there is such a huge um, drive also in the medical or biomedical domain um, because at some point we are at the end of our wits um, with these models. Um, and in these regards, data-driven approaches can help us understand it um, and then lead to um, discovery, lead to new, new fundamental principles. Um, and I, I'm very excited for the next few decades to see where AI itself is going, because so far we are doing... Uh, we, we are substituting things that we already know the answer to, right? We're doing classification or reg uh, registration with labeled data sets. Um, but the promise that AI, in my opinion, also holds is to discover new science um, with self-supervised or unsupervised approaches to an extent where we can actually create knowledge, uh, create new science. And I think this is very exciting. Amazing. It's a very uh, big pity that this is a virtual format. I would love to continue this discussion with you and <laughs> of you, uh, over coffee, but um, we're coming to an end. But um, before we tie this up, can uh, each of you uh, very briefly say um, uh, what kind of persons you're looking for in your lab, in your institute, in your center? Um, uh, what would the crowd uh, online uh, have to bring to the table to join your lab? Charles, you want to start off? Oh, definitely. I mean, we are always looking for people who are as keen as us on de model development, on applied AI, um, necessar not necessarily data science. You don't need to have studied this. I think we, not even computer science. I think more than half of our group is uh, from other domains. Uh, what you need to bring is curiosity, because uh, that is what, in our view, drives science, drives innovation, um, the eagerness to learn um, and to solve puzzles. Um, so to tackle things where you have no clue um, how to do them and to dive into this. Well put. Um, Robert, what's up with you? What kind of people are you looking for? Who can apply with you? I, I can just follow what just has been said, right? Uh, we need people who are motivated. We don't care so much for background uh, because at the end, uh, if people are curious and people are interested in the topic and uh, share our passion for simulation and science, then that's more or less sufficient. Of course, they... <laughs> 
uh, well, they, they uh, should be willing to suffer because that's just what happens. That's just, you, you can't help it, right? So you have to have some certain endurance with this. But that's true for many jobs, right? So I wouldn't say it's so different than our particular job. Uh, I think our job's particular cool, that's, that's for sure. Um, but you really need passion for this because it can take quite a lot of you uh, working in this field. So if you don't like that job, that's not a good uh, thing. But if you like it, look for open positions and apply. All right. Thank you very much. Wolfgang, what do we have to bring to the table to work with you in the Earth system modeling? I surely can only um, repeat that, that we need to be uh, to have people who are interested in working in teams and in interdisciplinary teams, people being interested in opening up their horizon. But we are also running data centers. So we are also addressing not only um, data science people here, but maybe also IT people. So the nice thing is what we have at Helmut in particular, also at Potsdam, we are running full data centers. So if, if you want to work in a data center and you want to get to know the business from running the network all the way up to HPC and, and GPU systems, you're welcome um, to apply. We still have a couple of positions open. So this is the other side, providing the IT and, and getting to know the daily IT business, uh, not only on the, on the high end research side. All right. Guys, it's fantastic to talk to you, but I do have to close this, uh, this session now. Uh, let me thank you uh, once again, Charlotte from uh, KIT, Robert from Forschungs Centrum Julik, and Wolfgang from Geoforschungs Centrum at Potsdam. It was great to have you with us and everybody connected from all over the world. Please do check out the expo booths later on and the job opportunities at all these centers, because as we learned today, here is where real computer science is happening. Is happening. It's not just informatics on a paper or the chalkboard, but you can build uh, large data sets and um, uh, obviously even larger machines with uh, robots. Thank you, guys, and talk to you later. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I can squeeze in one question, which, which was uh, quite highly ranked here, and I can. I think we can answer. This we can answer it. Okay, good. perfect. <laughs> so, um, as we promoted the supercomputer facilities here so highly, of course, there was a question if other people from other countries also can access them um, from from abroad or for their re researches. And um, I just want to announce: so if you want to. Um, yeah, test out uh, the facilities. We are offering hackathons, uh, of course, with KIT and Ulich resources, and they are also partly pa open to the public. So we are happy if you're um, joining those activities. And of course, you can get in contact with our um, experts and uh, see if yeah you can find collaborations in research. Yes.